Hello and welcome to another episode of Theme Park World Tour. We are back at the Chessington World of Adventures Resort and we're going to be giving a behind the scenes look at Room on the Broom. Let's go check it out and hear from Andrew Porter and Michelle Hicks who designed and constructed this fantastic attraction along with the rest of the team here at Chessington World of Adventures. The Chessington World of Adventures Resort is Great Britain's oldest theme park and not only were we going to go behind the magic of Room on the Broom, but it was also a unique opportunity to sample some of the special VIP animal experiences that you can book when visiting the park. <laughs> oh my god, there's something really satisfying Whoa. about that. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, yeah, exciting. Oh, hey, ladies and gentlemen. More about all that later, but now to Room on the Broom and to project manager Michelle Hicks, who began our tour with a look at the epic opening scene of Room on the Broom. So you have to bear with me as kind of watch, watch this mist away. <laughs> so this was actually like straight away, the, my favourite bit, my daughter and I both kind of jumped yeah. as the water came out. Just wasn't expecting it at all. So they're really effective. So we've got a number of different effects. It's about seven different effects that make these cauldrons do what they do. Um, so first thing we've got, we've got a spray machine around the back. Um, so you can just see it through there. And it's kind of, it's piped through, through this duct and goes up into, um, into uh, the cauldron see. itself. Yeah. So that's what does, um, when we get the big puffs of smoke, that's what releases that all into the air um, and gives it that magical effect. But we've also got this, this mist here, which I'm wafting away. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we call an ultrasonic mister. Um, and what does it does, it basically kind of vaporizes the water. It gives this kind of really low-lying mist. Um, so that gives this kind of, it, it kind of flows over the side of the cauldron. Um, so those two combine really well. We've also got air effects in here. Um, and the reason for having those is that once you've got smoke coming into the room, uh, it's going to fill the room. And if, if we don't get rid of it before projections start, you're not going to be able to see the projection. So there's a ring right around the edge of the cauldron. And that ring basically carries an airline. And that blasts up air, clears all the smoke, and then you're OK to get your projections. Right, I see, but I see. one of the things, we, we have to play around quite a lot of the timings in order to get the smoke effect we wanted, get it to fill the room, and then get it to clear in time. Um, there's other things in here. So there's a, the water plop is another air effect that comes up through the bottom of the cauldron. You just see where this ring of lights are. So it all combines and it's all programmed together to wow. uh, produce the show that we have in here. How far does that water go? Because it does feel like it's going to hit you. <laughs> if, if, we, if we turned it on now, it would hit it, it, I've been in here before looking at it and it's hit me in the face. <laughs> it's not going to hurt you. Um, but yeah, it, they come up sort of this sort of height. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a decent effect. You can definitely see it. <laughs> How important was the size of the cauldron? really important. Um, it's probably one that Andy can talk to you a little bit more about, Andy, if you want to advise. Hello. Hello. <laughs> He's here. I'm in the background sneaking around. Hey there guys. Mr. Porter. Hey, how you doing? All good. Um, Fastably so, late this morning, which uh, I apologise for. Yeah, all these creators you always ask. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the cauldron and the set design in, in general, with, with Room on the Broom, it was a mansion. It looks like a mansion on the outside, but the actual story of Room on the Broom is set in very many distant lands. There's forests, there's fields, and there's swamps. So we need to set the story up in a logical place that you've just come into a building. Well, the, the room already kind of fit like a magical enchanted library anyway, so we could use that. What we needed to do with the cauldron, this, it looks like the one from the, the, the story, but it's actually oversized. And the reason it's oversized, whereas the one in the finale, which you'll see later, is a lot smaller, yeah. is the one in the finale is actually the size of the scale that it should be with the witch in the movie. This one is oversized to fill up the room because the book is so huge. If we had that small cauldron, it just wouldn't have the presence. It wouldn't look very good and it just wouldn't really work, certainly with this, with this large bookcase. You'll also notice the design of the two is different. Obviously here you've got it on the stand. Uh, you've got the fire underneath, which is still warming up, I believe, for the start of day. Right. Um, so you, you've got this one here. It's very different to the one in the fly, which is kind of a tripod type thing. Um, so it's just making it fit in the space. And the whole attraction really, it's making sure each room, everything mm. is in scale, proportionate to each other. Um, otherwise oh, you'd, get, you'd feel it all out of scale. Well also on, on, on that point, um, 
with the tripod, the tripod is actually from the film at the end scene and it's in the finale, you'll see it in there. The reason why it's not in here is because I'm stood here and you can see my head yeah. and it's because of the projector. So all that math has to be done where we actually look at where can the guests minimally stand in the room. Yeah. So that's why the which is there. So they don't get their head on the projection, but also more importantly, how do we do this projection here so people can see it, but they don't get in the way of that? Because this projector here is filling up this space. So all that has to be worked out with how many people we can physically fit in this space to do the attraction throughput. And that all then comes into, if I'm stood here, there's my book, there's my giant bookcase with projections on, and there's the giant cauldron. So from a set design, point of view, it's all scaled and thought about. And the reason we've got this curtain hanging down on this wall here is to hide that projector there from a show point of view. So if yeah. you stand here, you I can't see, see it. See. And then when you do go into the room, yes, you can see it now because I'm here, but people are now focused on going into the attraction and they don't look behind them. The reason, the way we work out kind of where people can stand, it's all drawn up beforehand so that we know when it comes in, it's going to work and we're not going to get those shadows, as you can see uh, with Andy's head at the moment. So what we'll do is we put it into a piece of 3D software. We take each of the projectors, two projectors here, um, and there's basically a projection cone, and we move that around, we shift the angle of projectors, we move people around and make sure that they're not clashing effectively, and then um, and you don't get the, the head effect on the projectors. Okay, and it, cool. And it's creative ways to hide them. You can see here where we've, the, the projectors up there, which is the same as that projector, and we've got that table. The, the size of that table has been considered that you come in and you just don't see it. Yeah. It's also on that table so the airflow can keep the projector cool. Well, okay, cool. Yeah, we can't cover them up or they overheat. Um, okay. Really Another thing that's quite good to share actually is when we're looking at kind of what tech technology we're specific specifying to go into the attraction, um, we have to look at things like projection cones. So where are people standing in relation to the projectors um, in the pre-show and finale where we've got the projection map scene? So in this one, uh, you can see we've put the people around in strategic places. And what we're doing here is we're moving the projection cones where the light's coming out of the projector um, and watching where their shadows are going so that we can put the fence lines where we need people to stand and no further forward. Otherwise, you start getting people's heads and shadows, which is, is ruining the effect. So um, every room is designed to kind of take that into account mm. um, and make sure people can see everything they need to, but also aren't in impacting the effect. Today, I want to tell you a story about a witch who loses her hat, her bow, and her wand, and about all the new friends she meets on her journey. Gather round closely. Children to the front, please. Oh, I think I'm missing someone. Ah, there you are. The whole narrative of, with the IP of, of, of getting people into the story and the Gruffalo, it very much starts in actual Scheffler's um, world where it's the illustrated style where we've got his artwork around the horse. Mm, mm. Here we actually wanted to go kind of straight into the 3D world. So the cat from our story is asleep on the bookcase. It doesn't matter if you see him or not, he's there as an extra because I've got the projector anyway because I'm doing the magical door effect when the door opens into the attraction. And all of the design of the bookcase and how it's all put together is there to try and hide those lines where we've got this panel here that sticks out further to hide that edge of that door. Um, so the cat wakes up and then the kids go, look, I can see the cat, and it runs onto the bookcase. Uh, I know Michelle spoke about the special effects a little bit, but from a, when you write a narrative and you script a show, all the animatronics and all the special effects are considered. Why we've got that prop effect is when the cat and the witch throw their mushrooms into the cauldron, a little plot comes out, we break that reality between projection, what children and everyone are used to seeing on TV, and now something magical and real has happened because that mushroom has come off that page of that book and plopped into it, which then sets up for the very first scene when you see the meet the dog in reality. Are you two making a spell? Yes!
show them a secret bookcase. <laughs> So what we'll do when we're working on a project is we'll have a document called a theme book uh, and that's effectively our manual for the build um, and it will contain all of the details for all of the rooms so that we can pass that on to our, our construction team and they can build it exactly how we want, it, want them to do it. So what I've got on here is a typical page showing kind of the dimensions and, and this one in particular is the finale. So you can see we've got the 3D trees uh, with specific dimensions on and they're all agreed with the IP which is Magic Light. So um, that's all cut out specifically to how we want it. And then we've also got um, the layers on this one. So this was quite a complex one because we have um, different kind of cut out features that are projected onto. So what we had to make sure was that all of those physical cutouts were the right size for projected footage because we had different companies working on the theming who were also producing the content. So there's quite a lot of coordination that goes in um, between those different companies. Um, so if I just go through um, a couple more pages, I've got a plan view here. So it shows kind of how the animatronic broom slots in uh, behind the set. What we wanted to make sure is obviously when the broom isn't in its raised position at the end of the attraction, you can't see the top. And um, this was a little bit tricky because there's a big lantern on the top of the broom. So that's why so we have this raised section um, because that hides that lantern in particular. Um, so these are all of the animatronic drawings. Uh, so the way the broom works is it's an air system. So the air um, kind of pumps into the system, so it raises it up, and then the air is let out of the system, which then drops it down. Uh, but there's all kind of dampers on there uh, and pressure switches to control that movement. And that allows the show control system to know at any point exactly what position that broom is in. So it's speaking back and it's continually providing feedback. And that's how we know it goes up and down at the right point in the show. So some more details of um, the animatronic. Um, some spe specific dimensions for the broom itself when the theming companies are fabricating that. I'm guessing with this sort of stuff, the detail can't be too granular. You just you absolutely yeah. have to get into it, right? You, you absolutely have to, and particularly when you've got different companies working on it, you need to make sure they know exactly what's going on um, and also where the responsibilities lie and who's doing what. So as an example, this is kind of some of the in-progress thieving photos. So they're producing that in order to send it over to the company that's working on the mechanisms. They then fit that together and that all gets put in the attraction and all has to fit together. Is that similar from, sort of obviously, you have an approval process, especially mm -hmm. when dealing with an IP like, like this? Mm -hmm. Do they want to see that level of granular detail down to millimetres or do they just want the overall look and feel of the attraction before they sign off on it? Yeah, so whenever you're working with an IP, it's, it's remember, it's, it's their brand, it's, it's kind of their essence and it's so important to them, you can't provide too much detail, so it's a bit like when you're working with different contractors provide more rather than less. Uh, so we sent them photos kind of at every stage of the production process and made sure they're really involved with it and they have a chance to comment. Um, Magic Like were the IP on this uh, project. Um, brilliant, brilliant guys to work with um, and kind of work with us, cooperated with us. Um, but also we respect them and they respect us. So it was a really brilliant working relationship going forward with, the, with them. When the wind blew so loudly, it blew off her hat. Cried the witch, and they flew to the ground. Look at the get the ground closely. So, we've now landed in our forest. This is the point where we really wow the most our, most our guests. They've just been in a library. They've gone on a journey with the witch and they've landed in this beautiful forest. All the things have been done with the leaves, all the lighting has been considered with these Gobo lights to make different lighting effects around the world. It smells of a forest in here. And we've got this great 3D animatronic figure that's moving because you know children communicate with things with moving 3D better than they would with a screen. So we want guests to play, we want them to play with each other from adults to children and actually enjoy being a child again if they're an adult. So this room is really a group activity where we're inviting everyone in one group just to let their hair down, jump up and down to get the witch's hat which falls out of the tree which is another air effect which is controlled by sitting behind this wall. That way, the guests have immersed themselves in this room, they've immersed themselves in the attraction and they're ready to play with their families. So the activities that happen after this are a little bit more mum and dad playing with each other and the kids playing with each other as individual family memories. But this room is a group activity to introduce everyone into the attraction so they don't feel silly getting involved.
I am a dog, as keen as can be. Is there room on the broom for a dog like me? Oh dear, looks like Witch's hat is trapped in the tree. Everybody, come on, shove up and down. Like you say, it's this amazing blend of the physical, um, you know, and effect space stuff, really. Absolutely, and, and one of the things that's really important about this attraction is we, we had an orchestra recording. Um, a guy called John Sanderson from Pit Stop Productions uh, wrote the music with me to create a bespoke narrative that you don't normally hear in theme park attractions mm. because we wanted it to flow like a movie and we wanted it to flow like a musical. So the music in there is encouraging people to move on, to tell them that the scene's finished and it's now time to move on to the next one. And what we ended up getting was a piece of music which is, which is extremely beautiful just to listen to on its own, which is what we wanted. We didn't want it to sound like eating. So the dog room sounds like it's in a forest, this room sounds like it's in a meadow, and the instruments that he's used in the swamp sound like they're in a swamp. So the narrative is going along with what people are actually doing. Subconsciously, they're not picking up on it, but as an overall experience, it makes it into something quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. One thing you're going to notice after going for that room, which had a little bit of the music playing when we went down that first corridor, these rooms are in pre hot state. These rooms are waiting to be triggered. They're waiting for someone to say, okay, go, um, which I can, I can trigger her off um, now if you want me to, and you can see what I mean. So we've got, um, kind of they've moved the button. <laughs> 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 it's here. Okay. 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 very delicate, it's very light and it's bringing people on. Whereas when we go into the frog room now, that you will you know, you'll hear a very much big difference in what that sounds like. After the bird's room's finished, this room will then, the music will then move into this room to tell people to kind of move on. So now in the frog room, the music style is very different. Uh -huh. I am a frog, as clean as can be. Is there room on the broom for a frog like me? Oh dear me, the bullfrog has eaten which is one. Get the fireflies and see if he will give it back. So one thing about this attraction that we wanted to do, yes, it's, it's a children's attraction, the narrative, but we wanted it to be like a traditional fun house. So we've got those effects where we've got air, it's funny, it works well, and in the we've used the air effects to create those scares and create those jokes. And there's a few situations in Room of the Broom where we've actually done that. This room's one of them, and Wow. 
so impressive. And you can hear the music is really different while he's going to be scary. So, air effect, uh, smoke effect. There's a lot of concern about this guy when we were doing the attraction because of how scary the kids may see him. Yes. One thing to remember when you were attra designing the attraction is you don't betray your guests. We've set the whole attraction up to be light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Kids are now having fun. When we go into something that's potentially a little bit more scary, we light him up so people can see him and people can enjoy him. Kids can approach him, but he's not too scary. Yeah? And that's how we kind of do it. And we did the same with the Buffalo from going from the snake scene, yeah. which was very dark, to see the Buffalo who's laughing, and it's very light. Yeah. <laughs> Buzz off! That's my wish! And remember when we spoke about the cauldron in the first scene, this is the design of the cauldron from the attraction. Where it's got the the, the tripod. This is how big the cauldron should be in the first room. Right, right, right. You can see, like a magnificent suit. But we also wanted to have a wow moment in here with the 3D animatronic room that comes up. From a design and projection point of view, that's quite complex because we've got one projector there. behind it. So there are creative ways that you can use vinyls but also make it feel like it's part of the set because we've used 3D in clever places while it's all being kept safe. It's a great finish as well. It's not, it's not underwhelming once you've been through all that. It still really packs a punch at the end. It was important to us that we actually have all the characters fun, including our witch and everyone in, in full mm. size with the brood that comes up. You know, and then it feels like you've gone on an adventure with this family, mm. with your family. Absolutely. fantastic to spend some time with Andy and Michelle learning about the inner workings of Room on the Broom and how the project had even come to fruition. More from Andrew later on but now it was time to see some animals. After all before Chessington was a theme park it was originally a zoo. In addition to your park ticket you can book different animal experiences at Chessington and the park had kindly invited us to document some of them Theme park enthusiasts might recognise the guy in the yellow t-shirt. Is that your lunch, Sean? Here we are. Is that, your, is that your lunch in the bucket? Yeah, right. I know, yeah. No hot dogs in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to get electrocuted. That's always a good sign, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't worry. That's it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Oh, they're quite cute, aren't they? Quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh. 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 Obviously, they tend to live a little bit longer in captivity because there's more predators and they get fed and everything. So you can see as well, they've got the nose, eyes and ears all in line. <laughs> so when they're in the water, they can pop the face up so they can look around with the rest of the bodies are still under the water. So they can make sure you're nice and safe. You can tell how much you love your job. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a great job, absolutely. Then you get away. We are. In the sunshine, lovely. Oh, let me get that down here. Thank you. So I got this bucket twice a day. So they got all 
fruit and vegetables and in the wild they can keep out as well from the water. Two people have them as well if you guys want to, you can stuck them under the tin. They go like that. Nom 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 nom. Oh, yeah. oh you're enjoying that bit, it's alright. Enjoy your apples. <laughs> like to try a bit of celery. <sighs> nom nom nom. <laughs> wow. Your teeth are huge. They are massive. <laughs> Keep my fingers away. <laughs> Day, yeah. <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah. 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 So if you've uh, never done um, a VIP meet and greet with any of the animals here at Chessington and there's quite a lot to choose from, um, I really recommend it. It's something I've done with my daughter a couple of times and uh, Brazil now doing it with Sean from Pink Club Worldwide. So I am um, Chessington World Adventures for me was when I was about 18 years old and uh, I was really an enthusiast at that point um, and it was what I wanted to do for my living and I came to Chessington and it was such a different atmosphere it was such a different feeling where you had the animals and you had the rides and all the rides were kind of working towards being incorporated with those animals and to me it, it just felt like a really beautiful lush place to come and certainly from before where Alton Towers was my sort of stomping ground it was a different way to look at theme park design so it really inspired me one of the biggest changes you've seen here, obviously one of them you're a bit responsible for and it's just over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're really, really looking at animal conservation now. Uh, one of the things at Chessington, certainly with Land of the Tiger that we wanted to do was about these endangered animals that, you know, these have, already, these have been bred and brought up in captivities and they, they're from Carmarthen and they grew up next to a wooden roller coaster. Um, so we wanted to give them a huge amount of space to be able to walk around, engage with the guests if they want to, but also have fun and feel at home. As well with all the theming that goes on, we've got the ability with the zoo team to talk about the endangered species, talk about the work that's going on in the countries that these guys are from, to hopefully keep them around for future generations. And that's one of the big things that we take very seriously here at Chessington. And any time we do a new investment of a ride, we also make sure that animals play a big piece at the heart of it and they come first, prim primarily before the guest experience. Uh, so we mainly feed them things like horse meat, but sometimes beef as well. Maybe even some chickens, some hares, goats, sheep, all sorts of things. Now a little bit differently to um, sort of the wild, the things that they would eat in the world are things like wild boar, deer, maybe even some badgers. They've even been known to try and take down bears as well. Some of them have been successful, um, but obviously bears are very, very aggressive, just like our tigers, so they will put on a really big fight. Now the ways that we feed them, we um, sort of differ every single day. So Tiger Rock, Gruffalo River Ride, and now Rim on the Broom, three yeah. existing attractions that have been <laughs> rethemed. Do you find it's a harder process, retheming something or starting a new design from scratch, and which would you prefer? Do you know what? It's an it's an interesting question because I've I, I've done I've done them all. Um, I, I've built attractions like Oblivion at Gardaland from from kind of scratch and ground up, um, as well as Kung Fu Panda and Peppa Pig at Gardaland. Um, at Chessington, there is no real difference. It's 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 the same sort of way that you approach it. Okay, you've got you've got the building footprint, and you have the shape and the the spaces that you've got to work into. But as, a, as an entertainment designer, that doesn't matter. You've just got to look at those spaces from a creative point of view and tell new stories. It's just a different challenge and each individual problem has its unique thing. 
a lot of people look at a blank piece of paper and are quite intimidated that they've got to start from nothing. But even with something like the Gruffalo or Room on the Broom, you're starting from nothing again. So it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. So the Tigers at Tiger Rock, they've been here about 18 months now. Yeah. I remember initially they were chasing the boats all the time. They don't seem to do that quite so much. Yeah. Um, are they still happy? Have any issues with them or all going well? No, so the, the, the Tigers here have been absolutely great. I think it's because, again, they've been born and raised in captivity and they were born up with a roller coaster. So if you look behind you quickly at the top there, the one going across the top of the bridge at the moment, what what we found what we found is that now the tigers have been here for a year they've actually got their own zones that they like to be in so they're using the trails much more now than they did when they first came here they really enjoy walking around in the circle that we've created for them and that was important for me as a, as a design perspective that all of the enclosures here for the tigers are connected so enclosure A we can lock off if we want to but it's connected to enclosure B and it's connected to enclosure C and what you don't see off site is at the bottom of enclosure B is another gate. That gate runs around a trail that goes all the way through the, behind the tiger's head and comes into C. If you look through the teeth at the moment you can see a horizontal piece of metal that's actually the tiger trail and you may see that tiger go through there. So they can keep running around in a circle. They can go anywhere they want to be. We don't stop them from going anywhere that they don't want to be. And we're just seeing them having a great time. And as far as chasing the boats, they still do it depending what you're wearing. Okay. If you've got um, one of those kind of Eskimo hoodies on, which is quite fluffy, they'll chase the boat. And, they, and they, they generally love doing it. One of the things about having animals in captivity is you've got to entertain them. They're very curious. We get chili powder and we make trails around around the enclosure because it makes them quite interested. We put meat on different climbing trails for them to look at. But also the guests, they love interacting with the guests and they're very comfortable around guests and depending on who you are, what you're wearing and how you act with them, they'll normally interact with you. They, they, they're great to have here and they're, they're very at home. So uh, we've had the most amazing day here at Chessington and uh, I think we're now going to go out on one of their VIP uh, safari trucks which I've never done before. Jurassic Park in here sometimes. Thank you. From the size of it. But if you just put either hold it out like that and they'll grab it off of you, or put it in the palm of your hand if you're a bit brave and don't mind the slobber. Here we go. Oh, look at the size of their tongs. Oh, oh wow. Oh, wow. This is Keto here. So Keto's our greediest boy. And oh, the young boys behind us trying to have a look and oh, see. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> look at the size of that tongue. Oh, where did you come from? 45 Ooh. centimeters tongue. That is amazing. So uh, we're sort of in uh, the middle of where you drive through Safari, but um, we're actually getting up close and personal with some of these giraffes. So a little VIP feeding experience here at Chessington World of Adventures. You know she's not allowed to do that. Yeah, look in the room sometimes. Right, 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 right. This gives you a good idea on the size of these when you actually sat right next to them. Absolutely. 16 and a half foot tall. 16 and a half foot tall. We're just going to see a head emerge now. <laughs> it's going from out of nowhere. That's what's amazing. Oh, they just, they just come is. flying oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> Loving that there. Wow. Such beautiful animals. It's great to be able to see them so close. So now I'd say see the bottom of them. That's all amazing. Just so graceful. They're insanely graceful. We are surrounded on the sides. <laughs> I don't know we if you can see, but uh, they also attach this sort of long pipe to the side of the truck. 
uh, which is just to encourage the giraffes to come over. They fill it with their favourite food and nettles and that kind of thing. My own safari. And a lovely Holly who's showing us the ropes. <laughs> Uh, from the honey colour, yeah. uh, his markings are really, really nice and splotchy. So you can see it a little bit on the ones over there, the more splotchy that we've been in the uh, channels. Um, as well as the white sock markings there, so you'll notice that they're wearing white socks, which is the funniest thing I've ever heard. Uh, just because they have their markings started, they're kind of ankle area. Right, sure. They're beautiful. They are just absolutely stunning. Do you have a favourite? My favourite? <laughs> one of my favourites, absolutely, because I see this often. That's uh, Tonda having a nice little rest there. I'm surprised he doesn't even get away with that. The only cute gets quite worried about Tonda, won't let him sit down like that because it's a vulnerable position to be in if they're in the wild. Right. We'll give him a little kick in the side in a minute, make sure he stands up, make sure he's not on. Um, not too bad. Stick out the way he's dinner, you've got it. Incoming! Whoa, he's a tongue. <laughs> in the flat of your hand, you'll be able to kind of feel a bit more of his slobber. Um, I tell you, he wants to. Positive on do, do I want to feel any of the slobber? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Oh, that's a nice big bit for you there. There's younger boys on my side. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to go to the next one. Um, do you think there's a better example in the UK, theme park wise, of so much diversity when it comes to different rides and attractions? Obviously this is Britain's first ever theme park. Um, I still find it amazing just how fresh and innovative you're keeping everything here. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I get asked a lot, what's my favourite ride? What's my favourite roller coaster? What's my favourite theme park? And I can quite honestly say I don't really have one because each individual theme park you go to in the world, either in Europe or um, you go to Effling, or you, you, you go to Europa, or you go to Thought Park, Alton Towers, or Chessington. Every single one has its own unique atmosphere. Every single one has its own selection of rides and experiences to do. How the designers and the theme parks approach those different challenges fascinates me, and I, so I don't really, I, I don't really have one that would go, oh yeah, that's obviously the best because of X, Y, Z. Because actually, it's the guests, it's the staff, and it's the rides, and it's the people that make it. What we do have here at Chessington that's great is we've got animals and theme park kind of mixing together. And you know we've managed to do it in a way that's, that's, that's good for the animal, also good for the guests. And I say we can keep that conservation thing going with them too. What are we doing now, Sean? We're going on to the reserve. So, I don't really know what to expect, but we're about to find out. We're in our VIP truck, and off we go. Here we go, I'm waiting for them to start this custom made uh, Land Rover. It's not a Defender, is it? It's a Discovery. Discovery, yeah. Food time. Oh my this. gosh. Now <laughs> <laughs> go for it there. Wow. Look, it's there. There it is. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Wow, they're it strong. A bit of a test of strength. Wow, wow, they are strong. I wasn't expecting oh, that. Right. I'm not surprised. You never want to lose our skill. We're really We want some more for guys one more again. Here we go, my turn to attempt this, is it? Well, I'm hand. not very strong, but we'll find out. Whoa. Don't drop the pan. Oh! When you said they were strong, you weren't joking. No, yeah. Yeah, no. No, we got big boys. <laughs> it's making me look right weak, this is. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, blimey. 
Sean might look like he's struggling, but honestly, the, uh, <laughs> the strength the strength of these emperors is yeah. phenomenal. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I'll never look at a zebra the same again for how strong they are. And the two that you guys have just fed are only two years old. Wow. Two years old and they're, they're that like, strong. Uh, wow. Dare I attempt to give you this last <laughs> bit? You want that last bit? No attempt. <laughs> <laughs> Two years old and you're that strong, wow. <laughs> you see the one you're feeding now, Oberon's quite young, so with that flat oh, round it. face. It's all gone, it's all gone. No more. Don't look at me like that, it's all, it's all gone. <laughs> Who gets to name them? That's quite a cool name. Um, most of these guys come in from other zoos. Okay. We have a bachelor home, so they, uh, we look after them until zoos need them for breeding or anything. So like, uh, Angus, the one, Far left, but you fed. He was um, from Chester Zoo. I think Oberon was from Phantom Zoo. Step down, he is the bully. Oh, Feisty. Oh. 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 Flights <laughs> over it. That's it, he wasted it all now. Wow. Oh my oh, god. Oh, you want to have a look at that joke? <laughs> <laughs> shit, took pens. Hey, well, Adam, I think you should have a look yeah, at that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, what's he doing? Yeah. Go on. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my god. There's something really satisfying Whoa. about that. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Oh, you're getting excited now. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, calm what, down. What's this one's name? This is Oscar. 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 Yes, I like Oscar, but he's a bit fussy. Yeah, it's really, like, really satisfying just how, how quick he goes in there. Oh, yeah, really satisfying when you're holding up to yeah. it. <laughs> Fast. Like me when I walk into like Greg's or something that is like <laughs> Grandma oh, Soft Rolls. Yeah, that's it. Uh, wow. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> a few more. <laughs> Come on, Oscar. Oh, no. I think we're off, Oscar. Living the dream, man. Oh, hey, you're getting the rights of it on me as you're <laughs> down your throat. You get some more space. Okay. Yeah, Hi, <laughs> Oscar. Oh, oh, you're oh, just going to fall. Oh, yeah. shit. Going for more. Amazing to get so close to these animals. It's really yeah. is. Yeah. I'm going to find out. Oh, there we go. This is a bit scary, this. You can do this one, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and sit back as far as I can. <coughs> and... oh. oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, let me get the basket out. Oh. <laughs> it's not going too well. Hang on, that's it. Whoa! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh. They are strong. That is absolutely crazy. Yeah, and just like that. It's a two arm job. It's got, yeah, it's not great on the camera doing it, but there you go, I've attempted. You're right, you can get it from the floor. Oh wow. That's amazing. Scared How long have you um, been doing these little pieces of fun? Uh, we've been doing them for quite a while. It has varied with the animals that we have here, but it's always a staple at Tissing It's one of the things that we do all year round. We run two a day maximum, so it's always a VIP thing. Like, it's not something that everyone gets to do. But we also do uh, giraffe sparries and giraffe feeds as well, and a uh, rhino which is really special as well. We get to meet the rhinos really good for us. Just the sound of like bashing again, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you still get a real buzz um, seeing all these, there's lots of families and kids here today having, clearly having an amazing time. Do you still get a lot of satisfaction out of that? It's, it's why, it's, it's ever since I was a, when I was wanted to be a kid, it's what it do, it's what drives, it's what gets me up in the morning. Um, obviously I do the horror stuff as well. And being able to influence people's lives from an emotional aspect, as well as families having fun, making great memories with each other, they'll go home and remember this day for the rest of their lives. When time gets bad, when school gets bad, when the weather's bad, you can think back going, remember that time I had with my mum and dad at Chesterton Adventures and we laughed so much when we got wet on the ride because this happened. That means everything to me. Um, so yeah, absolutely, yeah. Cool. I'll never get bored of it. Even if we don't have one of these asses on, we can go along. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. And then um, we'll come out of feeder in the evening, so if you should still see them, that's really good for us. Chess Chessington in joke, by the way, is called an ass, which stands for African Animal Safari. Okay. It's a real thing. It's the African Animal Safari, which is the more grown up way of talking about it. <laughs> Hello. So, there we go. We've done all the food. <laughs> <laughs> 
step. <laughs> Big boy Quaid, he's the leader of the boys. Big boy Quaid, love it. So you saw that one night having that praying earlier? That's Quaid. Tell the others to move out soon. Come to stay all go. He's my favourite because he's the most handsome. Well, he doesn't feed him. That's about it for today here at Chessington World of Adventures. It never ceases to amaze me just what a diverse selection of rides and attractions they have here. Don't forget this was Britain's first ever theme park, but they've continued to keep things fresh and move with the times. Thanks for watching, and if you've enjoyed what you've seen, please do subscribe. I'll see you next time on Theme Park World Tour.